Well, yeah, maybe we'll jump in and get started. I feel like we have a few different faces than our usual for this in depth. Uh, so uh, Open Team, welcome if you're new. We're the Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management, which is a project of Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment. Um, our dynamic and growing community consists of over 35 organizations and 200 individuals who are active every month in various working groups and open team related meetings. Uh, so this in-depth learning series helps build the knowledge base of our community in a way that fosters coherence and collaboration. And each in-depth helps us to collaboratively evaluate new concepts, ideas, which we get to see today, and technologies in an effort to ask better questions and to build better tools through sharing our work. We seek to address common barriers rather than promote any specific solution. So in the pre-competitive space that we hold, we bring together public and private partners to achieve better outcomes and accelerate innovation by sharing across boundaries. So with us today, we have Douglas Gayton from the Lexicon of Sustainability and Nathan Shedroff, is that how you say your last name? Yep, that's right. Who's the executive director of Food Icons. Um, so they've been engaged in a really exciting initiative to create a type of universal language around food and ag icons. Uh, and there's a competition underway um, that they're gonna dive in and tell us more about. Um, so we'll have, I'd say 20 minutes, up to 20 minutes of presentation um, and then we can dive into some questions and um, we'll uh, end before the top of the hour. All right, um, Nathan or Douglas, feel free to share your screen and we'll go from there. Great, I'll, I'll start. Thank you everyone uh, for allowing us to, to speak with you and describe what we've been working on for a little over a year now. Um, this actually is a project that was initiated by Douglas and all the work he's doing across different food systems and recognizing that there are so many people doing similar things, but using different terminology and therefore having trouble breaking out of their silos. So we thought that uh, if we could create a uh, common shared visual language for food and, and for food terms in the food system, that might help bridge some of these uh, uh, differences of terminology and uh, especially when you talk uh, when you look at food systems globally and, and language isn't even consistent where we develop this as a mechanism to hopefully uh, uh, help spread understanding and uh, communication between various stakeholders uh, just to give you a quick overview we've devised this challenge as uh, uh, five challenges that we run. They run for about two and a half months each. And our, like I said, our, our goal is to develop this sort of common global visual language for, for food systems. And we're doing it in such a way that we're crowdsourcing these uh, icons uh, to designers all over the world. We have hundreds of designers from 80 different countries working in these challenges. And each challenge is focused on a little bit different part of the food system. But the idea is that all these icons come together as a family that are then open sourced via Creative Commons uh, for license, usable by anyone in the world for any purpose. So we've just completed, or we're just completing the second challenge. The first one was all we call it food foundations and it was all the kind of um, basic food stuff that you need to know, raw, frozen, uh, cow, chicken, different kinds of diet like vegan and uh, uh, Ayurvedic, for instance, just common sort of uh, foundational food, food items that cross lots of boundaries. Each challenge after that gets successively more, I would say sophisticated and more focused. So the one we're finishing right now is on is all focused on regenerative agriculture and climate change. And then the one that's just started is all focused on agrobiodiversity. So we have been working with different organizations to help shape the terms. And then uh, a lot of uh, members of those organizations uh, serve as food experts. So through the two and a half month challenges, we have designers submitting sketches. Then we have a critique period for about a week where we have food experts 
critiquing those ideas based on how accurate or how, uh, you know, how, how well they're communicating the concept. Then they have a design phase. We also have design judges judging and giving critique from a, a visual standpoint. They have this design phase, then we have another critique, and then they have a refinement phase. So there's three phases throughout each of these challenges. Um, we also have a really wonderful partner in Adobe who has made this project their annual design initiative. So the Adobe design icon design team, uh, mostly in Hamburg, uh, has set the guidelines for the icons that we give out to the designers so that they can work with a common uh, design language and elements so that when these icons come back, they actually look like they fit together. And we've developed a few uh, use cases about what these, you know, where these might show up. Obviously, there's a lot of po potential for uh, communication with consumers, whether it's on packaged goods or ingredients. These may show up right on the packaging sometime, uh, but also in things like menus to, to denote diets or allergens. Um, prepared foods. We're working now with a couple companies that operate food service so that they can use these icons as ways of communicating to employees in their in the partner companies. Um, but we also see a lot of a lot of digital opportunities for education, um, for farms to communicate how they grow things and and why what they do is special. In fact, this is a another accelerator that we're working with um, through the lexicon called Regen One, where they're helping farmers uh, describe how they raise either, you know, animals or uh, grow, uh, you know, grow uh, fruits and vegetables and grains, et cetera, so that they can essentially get credit and get recognition for the kinds of techniques that they use. Um, and this is just one of those applications. So we expect these icons to show up in different kinds of uses, uh, use cases in education and a great deal in industry. So we're hoping that this isn't just used by people in the food system to communicate to consumers and customers, but it's used uh, to communicate amongst themselves so that they can see the commonalities in what they do and, uh, and where, you know, where they're going. Maybe, so maybe this, Dave, and at this, if I could quickly interject for a second to show yeah. actually what that looks like uh, in Regen 1, um, which is specifically about regenerative, that might be good or you want to- Yeah, go for it. Um, as Nathan mentioned, um, Dorn and uh, about a hundred folks are, are in an accelerator um, that's led by the lexicon focused on regenerative agriculture. And uh, one of and which will uh, be released and go public in June, on June fifteenth of this year. All of the producers that are onboarded into Regen One um, go through an onboarding process that describes not only their practices but also um, all of the outcomes, the ecosystem benefits that they're supporting through their work. Each of those can be described with an icon, and so. Um, what they're calling, since it's different for every producer, they're calling this the farmer's digital fingerprint. And it's different for every producer. Um, and then it, it helps to explain uh, the way that they break down regenerative is according to these five principles. Uh, I mean, sorry, these five ecosystem benefits, soil, water, air, biodiversity, and equity. And each of these are an outgrowth of, um, of what is information is gathered in the onboarding. And as you can see, the icons play a pretty prominent role um, for all of the storytelling, not only for purchasers, but also for uh, consumers. Yeah, and I should probably uh, note that many of these terms are pretty sophisticated, as you know, and, and we don't expect, uh, we don't think that it's possible for you know each of these icons to be immediately identifiable and understandable by everyone. There's going to be 600 of them at the end. Um, but we do think that they, and we do hope that they become eminently learnable in the same way that we're all familiar with the recycling symbol now with the sort of three arrows that circle together. That wasn't necessarily clear that that was recycling in the beginning, but now we've all learned that uh, icon to, to have that meaning. So we're hoping the same thing um, grows within this system. Uh, let me just uh, quickly show you some examples of where we were. 
Uh, this is from the Food Foundations Challenge, the very first one. And we up we we front loaded some really important things like allergens and diets, et cetera. So we have a system that uh, allows us to communicate when some when an ingredient uh, is present and when it's not present uh, in these variations, et cetera. So we have a bunch of allergens, probably about 15 of them already done. These have gone through the entire system and we're getting ready to release these actually in, in a, just a few weeks. All of these will be available at a, at a website called the Noun Project, which is sort of the biggest repository online globally of icons. They'll also be available from our site as well. So these have gone through the whole, <laughs> the whole process. Um, and I have to say these are in many ways, even though there's, there may be some things that uh, not everyone's familiar with like Ayurveda, um, these are for the most part much more approachable and, and sort of simpler terms. Um, and in that case, uh, it's a, 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 a little bit easier competition and, and, and the judging process, et cetera. So we're really happy with where we ended up here. And at the same time, this regenerative uh, agriculture and climate change um, uh, challenge that we ran uh, that we're finishing now is a these terms are much more complex and and quite frankly we need help uh, we have had food experts working on prioritizing these terms this is these are all 150 and nine of the terms from this second challenge um, and and they're just a lot more sophisticated as you well know than pig cow you know packaging etc how and do you uh, open team how, did um... And Open Team did help contribute to this list, as you remember, Laura. That was back right. in, I think it was December when we first talked about this list. And so a lot of Open Team members um, contributed to adding terms to the list or moving terms around or suggesting yeah. alternate uh, wording for specific concepts. Well, and and the one of the interesting things that we've learned is that um, when you start communicating visually. Uh, terms relate to each other in a different way. Um, you know, the difference between carbon sequestration and carbon sink and carbon fixation become uh, a really interesting discussion. Uh, we also have uh, found opportunities for new modifiers and elements, you know, to communicate a concept. So if you have a concept like, um, well, greenhouse gases, for instance, you, you know, once you here, I'll, I'll jump you right into the current challenges uh, book here. All these Dorn, windows open. Something, this is something, Dorn, you'll be very interested in. In working with Adobe, we realized that <clears throat> um, modifiers are going to be a secondary language. And so, mm -hmm. like, for example, let's say you take a cow's head you can put a modifier that shows grass, so it's 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 pastured. It's a pastured cow. You can even show like knives that show that it's it's a slaughterhouse or a, a, a paring knife, so it's being used in a kitchen or a fork. It's being used, um, you know, it's being right. eaten. You can so you, you start to create modifiers where these icons then become almost like a parent, and then there's different states. You could call it parent-child relationships. You could call it use cases or uh, the modifiers are going to be very, very big. And I think it's something that Dorn is going to allow you to get that level of precision that we were trying to figure out how we were going to do back in November. Well, and it's very clear to us now that those opportunities for modifiers don't even show up until you're in the middle of the challenge and you're, you're seeing these ideas come from the designers. Um, so this is a very organic process that sort of goes both ways. But here are many of the icons that have uh, made it through to you know the end of the, the challenge. And you can see how we're looking at ways of standardizing um, elements and how we're trying to communicate uh, some very sophisticated uh, concepts. And that's really where we could use more input, quite frankly, from experts. We want to make sure that these icons are accurate as much as you know any graphic language can portray. Uh, we want to make sure that they're communicating at least in a learnable way, if not in an apparent way. Um, some of the things that have come back, come up in the 
the previous challenge, for instance, is sure that's an icon for fish, but that's not a species of fish that anyone would eat. So let's change that out for something that that would be eaten. It's that kind of level of detail we're looking for expertise and involvement so that we can make sure that these are um, as usable across the food system as possible. Uh, and that's why we're here today, actually. And that's pretty much all, everything I've got. A little bit under 20 minutes. Well, fantastic. Well, I think this group would, at least I'll speak for myself anyway, I'm excited to get into walking through some of those problems and, and finding out how we can best uh, contribute. And I mean, that's always been my, my, uh, my conversation with Douglas o over time is, uh, you know, how can our community engage in the versioning and governance of this as we use both these terms, but recognizing that there will be new terms uh, yeah. and so forth. So uh, um, uh, maybe, maybe if you might both speak a little bit to how you envision this un unrolling post uh, release uh, and what are, you know, I think a number of us are, are huge fans of the, of the noun project and use them a lot and uh, have our own uh, curated collections, but we'd really love to understand sort of the process for curation and, uh, yeah. and, uh, and so forth as well. Well, great. Thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, there's really two main ways that uh, uh, you could lend your expertise. One is on the validation of the lists of terms for the, the challenges that are coming. So we have two more challenges after this, one focused on food waste uh, and true cost accounting, essentially, and then the uh, food packaging, and then one based on sort of circular economy of food and protein reframed, et cetera. So we would love your input uh, and, and you know, uh, expertise in validating those lists, adding to them, editing them down, et cetera. So that's the first way. The second way is um, we need commentary on the icons that we're getting back through these challenges. So anyone that um, in your organizations that are interested in serving as a food expert judge. Uh, we have <laughs> we have this big set uh, from the second challenge already that we need some fine tuned uh, commentary and critique back on. And so there's an immediate uh, opportunity there. I can make a special version of that uh, Google slide deck available uh, for anyone that wants to come in and, and make commentary on specific icons about what's working or what's not working. To me, okay. those are the, the two current ways um, that I would love to, to collaborate. There's probably uh, more ways after that in terms of how these get applied and where they get applied and, and how we spread the word. Uh, but we want to make sure that these are usable to you and your community. So, you know, this is an opportunity for us to learn from you about what would be usable and, and how best to make them available. Fantastic. One, uh, one, uh, one uh, example I'll give the group is our work in agrobiodiversity. Um, the FAO and a dozen Rome-based agencies are having um, the first really massive agrobiodiversity Congress this November. And they have worked with us to select the terms uh, of which there's a hundred and something terms and um, they will be releasing and using the icons in all of their materials across all of these different FAO partner organizations um, throughout the summer and into November. It's gonna essentially be their, the visual language that helps define their aspirations and, and their work. And so um, the reason why it's been so important working with Adobe is that they've helped us to design a system where people can add more icons over time that will all be in the same in the same style. So it'll always feel like it came from the same hand. That's the beauty of it. Um, in terms of, you mentioned the term governance. Um, you know, we're still working that out. Uh, you know, uh, FAIR, which is the leading organization for food allergens, you know, has now started a conversation with us for all of our allergens icons to be um, to be used um, as part of their standard messaging 
for, for food allergens, which could be, as an example, something that's very exciting, which you would think existed already and doesn't exist. So um, it really is, uh, Doran, um, in each case, the icons that were created almost have their own audiences uh, for climate, working with Drawdown and through, through, through that org, and that's one audience. Right now, the next sprint is on food loss and food waste. So that's with ReFed and all those folks, it's another audience. And so it's important to work with the primary practitioners in, the, in those domain areas because they will, they'll have the greatest likelihood of using them. I know Betsy put a note in the comments here from, um, from uh, um, Field to Market, you know, these would be, Betsy, these icons would be available for you to use and it would be really great for you to look at the icons that we maybe don't have. Um, sure. Um, try to capture all of those, the outcomes and the ecosystem benefits have been a high priority for us in terms of the, the icon. Yep. Well, Betsy, do you want to actually repeat your question and then we could dive it into that? Sure. And, I, 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 yeah. and I'm actually wondering just to prompt Douglas and Nathan whether we might even do a little walkthrough with the icon library you've got there to see uh, see what that process might look like. So first of all, I just wanted to sh uh, share with both Nathan and Douglas, thank you. Uh, we undertook uh, with a limited nonprofit budget, this was probably, oh, two to three years ago, the desire of like, how do we convey these complex concepts in a way that farmers will quickly understand the way that uh, more of our downstream brands and retailers are looking to engage consumers uh, can more quickly visualize. So knowing that you all are working on this, I'm super excited and would love to dialogue further. Uh, have great respect for, for Drawdown and, and 350 and guiding you all for climate and refed on food waste if field to market could help we focus on commodity agriculture, so we don't cover all of it, um, but we could we could give you a start. And I, my question that I raised in the chat, is there a chance to, I love the digital uh, fingerprint concept that we connect individual practices with the ultimate outcome that they help improve. And there may be co-benefits that may be challenging, but we have found for farmers specifically, the ability to, to give them the freedom to, to innovate, but to understand that correlation between specific practice adoption and how that may move the needle in improving biodiversity, sequestering soil carbon, those types of things. So just, you know, curious, first of all, how can filter market be a resource for you all in this space? And, and second of all, um, more of the perhaps interconnection or linking that you might be doing between icons uh, as, as an opportunity. So you talked about the connection between practices and outcomes. Is that what you? That, yes, that, 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 that being the primary connection of, is there a way to help um, visually strengthen that? Uh, yeah. So for example, relationship, however you want to look at it. Right. So for region one, which is very, you know, uh, producer centric and I should full disclosure, Doran is a very active member of the group uh, at region one. This, this literally, would be all of, when you do your onboarding process, you can talk about everything you're doing, this would be all of the practices, and then this would be all the outcomes associated with it. And then um, this connects to the ecosystem benefit right here. So the icons are gonna be very, very critical for how we message all of those things. You know, in a way, Betsy, the icons, when you first look at them, it looks like an art project, but what you really realize is it's a literacy it's a literacy project. It's about giving people fluency in a way that they don't even really realize that's what's happening is that when you start to group ideas together iconographically, you're basically giving somebody a, a new language. And um, it's non intrusive because it, do, it doesn't assume that you know or don't know something. Um, just it lay, it, it's laid out in a way that invites you to explore it. And so often people might think that they know a concept, but aren't totally sure this will be create a, a shorthand for doing that and um, but not just for um, experts uh, we think one of the main audiences is going to be uh, consumers uh, uh, people often don't give consumers credit but when consumers learn what a cage-free egg was or what antibiotics were in meat or what hormones were in milk they literally change entire verticals in the food system overnight all because of literacy all because of learning a single term so we feel that coming out of COVID, 
people, pe people being more connected with food on a local level, there's an opportunity to re to reinvigorate or re-engage or reset people's relationship with food and present it to them in a way that can have much more um, impact. Um, since this is a group that's specifically focused on uh, on regenerative, um, when Regen One was put together, it was put together with people who had all these different areas of domain expertise. And so, for example, we had like a former editor. Uh, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, former art director of Wired Magazine, uh, alongside of you know somebody from Whole Foods. And so, when we put together. Uh, when we put together like region one, we asked all of them to join. I'm not, I don't know if you can see my screen. We had place-based um, experts who came up with a place-based language. And then we got together and said, well, how would that look at Whole Foods? And so we literally took the Foodicons, you know, Lundberg is in the accelerator as well. How would it look like with Lundberg's so or we have the leading farmer's markets in our region. You know, if you were gonna create information booths with all this iconography, uh, we have CSA, so, you know, literally printing this on CSA boxes, good eggs is in our accelerator. So how, you know, how you do like meal delivery. And then as Nathan said, we've literally built an app as Dorn knows that will be going live in June where you can literally scan a product and it will deliver the entire story of that producer on a mobile app, all based upon uh, uh, Foodicons. So the Foodicons are really a communication platform that's designed to create greater literacy um, among consumers, but also give producers the opportunity to finally have people understand what they're doing. You know, they want to get, um, they want to have um, a premium that they're paid for all of these practices that they're implementing, but how do they communicate the value of that? And we think that the food economy is going to be, be a really valuable way to um, create a greater awareness at a purchaser and a consumer, and then have them actually see what, how those benefits can actually come back and actually positively impact them in their, in their own communities. So, Betsy, I wanted to pick up on that that dynamic of the, uh, the the practices and outcomes, and add another element to it too, which is the planning process, um, because I think that actually some of this can come together, you know, visually to represent again that 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 relationship between uh, planning practices and then outcomes over time, and and some of the modifiers that we discussed uh, earlier were sort of sort of around uh, or, or really more sort of practice-based or more about nouns, but there's a, there are modifiers that are more sort of about verbs too uh, and sort of uh, process-based and then also even be able to communicate some of our uh, concepts like uh, whether it's resolution or confidence or we've, we're working, you know, through terms and or modifiers to sort of uh, represent level of fidelity of a certain claim or so forth too. So I think there's a lot that can happen with that visual language uh, that is, you know, even more towards a, sort of a, a scientific audience, but starting with some of that same foundation um, and be able to go a little further. Um, and that's that's some of the things that I've, I've, I've kept on coming back to Douglas too, uh, in terms of uh, even on the data types and, and sort of exchange and permissions as we're working from a producer, what they're agreeing to share and how it's going to be used I think can follow some of these same design cues. And so that's something that uh, I've been particularly interested in sort of picking up, but these are sort of the first steps that I see. Um, and and uh, so, I mean, I wanna invite uh, certainly more questions and conversation. Um, I would also love a, sort of a, a more detailed walkthrough of some of the categories and, and examples uh, that uh, are, are close to your finalists and or where you have real sticky areas where we can be thinking about uh, as a community and then come back and participate uh, you know more fully on on those areas but I, I want to make sure that there's room for questions and uh, from folks bef before we do that sure Carolyn put a um, a um, a question in the chat maybe we should get that first and Nathan we can start to drill down sure so um, you, you, you talked about like uh, certain icons, you know, I think uh, Carolyn, the icon I always talk about, about a failed icon is the polar bear on the ice floe. Because you've never met a polar bear, you've never seen an ice floe, you don't know what you did specifically to put the polar bear on the ice floe, you don't know what you're going to do to get the polar bear off the ice floe. So you literally are 
no longer obligated <laughs> because you don't actually know how you connect to it. You've got to make the connection closer to people and make it more tangible to people. But I think that also that becomes, that comes, the problem, Carolyn, comes out of a lack of understanding of the complexity of things. And I think that if you can build taxonomies um, that have parent-child relationships that can break down complicated ideas, you can give people fluency um, in specific subject areas, which is why we've always tried to work with domain experts in each of the areas for Foodicon so that we know that these are the core terms, the core concepts that they talk about when they talk about a subject. They're the building blocks of ideas, you could say. And so I think that that's the starting point for us. The nuance is gonna come from taking those entry level ideas and then having the fluency to add supporting ideas after that, or as what I was saying at the beginning with Nathan, these modifiers are gonna be critical because they're really gonna dial in specificity. And it's right now, I feel like it's a very inarticulate language that we're putting together food cons, but it became dramatically more articulate when working with Adobe, Nathan was able to add these modifiers, which really is, that's the most exciting thing, Dorn, I, I would think in terms of data and precision of what Open Team's about is being able to take a concept and then add modifiers to it that get to specificity, granularity, um, that otherwise you really can't get with a general icon. Well, and I guess in the digital format too, you have the ability to have a sort of glossary of terms. So it's inter it's a bit interactive to help explain and, and sort of learn the language as you're viewing it too. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I, and I guess I'd be interested from Nathan or but, but between the two of you, sort of how that, pro you know, what, what is actually part of the noun project and what is sort of the implementation of it? Because there, and that comes down to the governance too. It's like, how, how are we, making sure that we're creating appropriate definitions and boundaries between some of these icons. You, you brought up two great points. Uh, you want to take the first one? You want to take the NAM project one first, Nathan? Yeah, I, I think that uh, at this point, uh, to be honest, we're a little bit overwhelmed running these challenges. And so our focus is really getting through them, right? Getting, getting these 600 uh, plus icon sets together, making sure that they're as clear as possible. And, and while we have created some examples of use cases, we know that uh, people in the food system are gonna be using these things in ways we never imagined. So we're not, so, I at least am not so focused on the application right now. It's, it's more about you know, generating these in, in the first place. Noun Project has been really uh, accepting and, and interested. And um, I, I think it, it really depends, you know, like we'll find out what happens once we, uh, make the first set live uh, next month sometime and start promoting them so that people see them and start using them. But I, I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised about how these are used and, and, and where. I think two things, I think where Budokaz is not there yet, but I could imagine when it wraps up in July, August, they're going to be released at the UN Food System Summit in uh, September. But I can imagine that Ultimately, all the icons will live on the NAM project, which is a great distribution platform for the icons, first of all. Secondly, I can imagine that in the, each of these subject areas, there might be a governing body. It could be open team for regenerative agriculture icons, for example. It could be a governing body that is different for each of these subject areas so they can maintain the, governments, the, the governance and um, work with us on adding new concepts um, and I think that that will be something that would, that'll be a natural evolution, or at the minimum, uh, advisory boards for each of the subject areas that would review and nominate new new terms um, uh, to be added. In the in the chat, Tom uh, Tom asked yeah. um, about um, image recognition. Tom, the uh, the app that both Nathan and I showed uh, is an image recognition app. Uh, it literally. Um, we could, uh, with the, uh, and the maker of that app is one of the leaders of the accelerator. We anticipate that there will be a Foodicons app where you'll literally, literally be able to take your phone and just take a picture of any icon and it'll tell you what it means, uh, like right there from your phone. That's not the technology, that's what we're already using already for Region 1. So it's pretty minor. It's just image recognition uh, technology. And that would be a great way, um, certainly, to, to spread. Um, the dissemination and to make it more easier to understand these things. 
Um, the great thing about the icons is that, as Nathan uh, foreshadowed, is that it, it, it allows people to localize them in their own languages and use them in local contexts. And we haven't even, you know, with the agrobiodiversity, Congress for agrobiodiversity, with, you know, the allergens, we're, we haven't even started yet. We already have groups that want to work with us to adapt those icons into their ecosystems. Right, and, and Jamie, you had a, a, a comment here, a question about um, how we're constructing this grammar. And it, it's been pretty interactive because um, it's not always clear in the beginning what elements are going to become, you know, opportunities for a standard, you know, uh, a, a standard grammar, a standard term. For instance, a, a cloud is now becoming a fairly popular within our within the the family a fairly uh, popular way to identify climate. It's not the only way because if you come out to the global level, you know you can't see clouds from the earth, right? When you have a globe, but for many of the terms around climate, that cloud is becoming a, a new kind of standardized element. So now we're going back and looking at, is there a way to standardize that cloud so that it's consistent to all of these elements? The same thing with the modifiers in the bottom with, you know, plus minus up, down, et cetera. We've been generating more and more of those as we have these conversations um yeah so it's been a completely interactive uh, process also uh, jamie, because... yeah but uh, what, like one other thing jamie is that you know in, in the german language they make they make up terms right all the time they create they, they bring multiple concepts together to create a, a term right and it's very it's very common in uh, german language to do that when you're trying to figure out something that you want to say you don't want to be hindered by the lack of a word to express it you'd simply just take ideas and push them together we think that with this hexagonal approach, this uh, you know this hive hive structure, that people will will be able to take these hexagonal single images and string them together in clusters and make clustered nested concepts that show the relationships or the dependencies of ideas and how they all fit together. That's why when we showed you the digital fingerprint, that was what was so fascinating is that you can create a larger understanding of something um, by nesting things together. You know, Betsy talked about connecting ways to show the connection of a practice to an outcome. Betsy, there might be that the hexagon for the practice is big and, the, and then all the outcomes that it connects to might be nested around it smaller or the other way around that you have an outcome and these are all of the practices that, lead, can, that can help lead to that outcome. We think nested relationships um, the hive mind structuring, um, putting things together in that way. Um, it's the classic case of we don't know yet. Uh, it's going to be revealed to us uh, once these come out. But already we know from Regen 1, from the designers that are taking these things, we've already seen them turning them into mobile apps, turning them into finger fingerprints, using them for signage and stores. So we already know that we are solving um, a, a communication challenge for people um but i don't think we've got there yet i think we're just starting of understanding what the language is so you don't want to be like prescriptive about it too much at, at least not this early on i think exactly that, that they would tell people well you know we already have learned from the, like for the digital fingerprint for example we're, we're yeah. learning how people are using them the modifiers i've met it i nathan i've mentioned it three or four times because when we first started talking about with Dorn about this, there was this, there was the limiting, it was limiting uh, because the icon didn't have state information, right? And so now with this whole modifier thing and then Adobe was all over it as soon as we explained this, I think we're gonna have a whole secondary style guide just to explain a modifier library. So when people create icons, they can, really get into nuance by using the modifier library. And I think also, Jamie, there will be in six months, a combinatory, um, a language string that will come out of this where people start to show how to do compound ideas. I think it'll be uh, obvious and evolutionary. Yep, agreed. Great. Um, I think we got a bunch of folks requesting to, to dive into the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. into the icons and, and maybe, 
I, I forgot to ask also that a noun project is mostly in a uh, single color, but it, that's a, one of the modifiers that I know that we've been discussing too, is color is meaning. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, uh, our process has been um, a fairly classic from a design standpoint. We want to make sure they work in monochrome first. We, we sort of envision that this is going to uh, evolve the same way emojis have. The first emojis were sort of monochrome and they've been successively gotten more and more illustrative, full color, shading, etc. So we think that there's a long evolution to these things over time. <laughs> we didn't want to go there first because obviously some of those limit how they get applied and etc. Uh, let me quickly take you to because you talked about you know curious being curious about the categories. Let me just take you through the categories and how we've organized things for this particular challenge and then we'll jump into the icons too. One of the things in order to manage this with all of these volunteer designers around the world, we've had to break up the categories into subcategories and sort of um, uh, manageable designable bits. So as you can see here, here's in, in, in column three, there's all the terms and we've grouped them around categories that seem to make sense and also where there may be opportunities to unify a language between those icons so or those terms so here is air and things like you know methane and methane emissions and co2 and co2 emissions go uh very much together uh there's a bunch in carbon here we've had to break them into three categories because you can't give a designer 25 terms and and hope to have them all come back um uh, we've got uh, a couple categories here around climate change. This is where some of the most interesting and I would say difficult uh, uh, terms to communicate have been for the designers. Uh, we, so we have these four categories of climate change. And then we start a very large list of different regenerative farming uh, sets of uh, terms. So we've had to break this up into not just uh, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, but also in terms of like the benefits from regenerative farming, different ways of doing metrics, nutrients, people involved, et cetera. So uh, this was a huge chunk to swallow and, and try to bring uh, some structure to in order to prepare them for the designers. Uh, we've got a whole bunch on sale, uh, soil, water, rangelands, uh, and we have a whole separate category here that I haven't, that's not even on this list on just environments. So riparian and wetlands and um, steep valleys and narrow valleys, etc. And a lot of that came uh, back from the usage in the region one project where they needed to signify these things. So those weren't even originally part of our terms, but they already needed them for their application. So we've been working back and forth with them about that. Uh, if you have any questions about the categories, now's a good time to do it. Otherwise, I'll jump right into the icons. Anyone? I think everyone wants to see, <laughs> see the work. Uh, let me just jump right into one of these. Here we go. Okay, so here we are in the challenge two, and this is in the climate change um, category. And you can see that, you know, we get designers, we get alternative designs from different designers. And so we have choices to be made. These are two very different icons. And we're, you know, obviously, we're getting comments about the one on the right being more simple and, and uh, direct, but we have questions about is it, is it clear? Is, is that truly climate smart architecture, uh, agriculture or not? Um, the same goes through, you know, with climate mitigation, here's three completely different approaches to communicating climate mitigation. And so we're having these discussions within the, the Google slides about which ones we prefer and how might they be changed. That's where we really need expertise. Um, this, this set has been really interesting because the one on the left was originally submitted for drought as well. And we have a term for uh, in the competition for desertification, but we actually liked the one on the left better as desert, uh, desertification rather than drought. So we're essentially switching the term for it. And what we liked about drought 
uh, on the right there is that it's showing the plant in distress, not just showing that the, there's a lack of water. We had a bunch of uh, ideas for colony collapse disorder, some of them very complicated. And what we went back to was the original Adobe icon for beehive. Um, and all the bees are on the ground dead. And, and that's the kind of simplicity that we're hoping to achieve with many of these icons. This, <laughs> this one has been a really interesting one. You can see the icon on the left um, for tipping point. Um, this is what was submitted and it essentially made uh, no, it was not clear to anyone in, in uh, of the food experts and the design judges what it was saying. So in talk, in discussing this, uh, we've sort of come to maybe these two uh, icons as a, a better indicator of what tipping point means, certainly in terms of climate. Um, but we haven't gotten feedback yet amongst our community of, about these particular uh, icons. This is a, a good example of the kind of dialogue that's going on um, within this process. Uh, I, we've got some really nice uh, 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 comments back about this one for ad adaptation. And I have to say that's something that never would have occurred to me, but really has a, a sort of wonderful lyrical quality as a result. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Here's some other sophisticated terms. Um, we have elements in the system like these circulating uh, arrows around the border that we can use to show a system. And so here the, the, the opportunity to show different states of water um, moving, circulating in a system, I think has become um, a, a really clear uh, way of communicating, in this case, evapotranspiration. And this also may then double for, this is where when you're talking about a visual language, um, it transcends some of the differences within, a, a, let's say, a, a, you know, a literal language, a word language, or spoken language. Evapo, this icon for evapotranspiration here um, may in fact be the same icon we use for water cycle because it's essentially communicating the same thing, even though those terms were in different parts of the, the challenge. Uh, we have, uh, we've been talking about different, uh, so these are two different uh, icons for biogas and they have very different connotations. So we're working through what would be a more useful connotation for the purposes of the communities we're trying to hit. And then we have this icon for biome that everyone kind of loves to look at, but, but is, is not really communicating what a biome is, unfortunately. So we, we may need to either modify it or go back to the drawing board altogether with it. Here we're in the environments uh, uh, category, subcategory. Some of these I think are working really well, like flatland, uh, especially in relationship to the other environments. Um, hold on there. Um, floodplain, I think, is working really well, for instance, the difference between coastal and coastal fog. Uh, so you can see some of what's been um, building up as uh, common elements to communicate. When we get into um, obviously, other uh, environment term, uh, they, it gets much more difficult. So migratory pond here is mostly working, except the birds are just not communicating. Um, lake has been, uh, you would think lake would be fairly easy, but uh, it's actually been fairly difficult to, um, to differentiate. And so um, all the, all the uh... All, all of the icons that Nathan is showing have design judges and have food system experts judges offering perspectives from, you know, from their singular vantage points, because obviously the designers don't have backgrounds and knowing what the, what right. the concepts mean. 
Uh, let me uh, jump to regenerative agriculture and biomimicry. Biomimicry has been a really interesting one to, to see how the designers have um, uh, interpreted that. Uh, I think this one has a lot of potential, but it, it needs some refinement. Um, the airplane in this case isn't really looking like a air, to that much like an airplane. Um, but that's part of the, the fascination and, and really the joy of being in this project has been to, to be exposed to all these different interpretations and then having to um, uh, choose and choose between them and, and make suggestions about how to modify them, for instance. Uh, let me jump to some ones that maybe are, uh, these ones are really in transition. Um, part of, partly, uh, these have some visual problems from a design standpoint. The, for instance, the weight, the, the line weights aren't consistent. We need to, to work with the designer to fix that. But um, trying to uh, communicate these concepts has been really challenging. Uh, in this case, crop rotation really isn't working, we feel. Um, and intercropping is maybe accurate, but still not really communicating. Same thing with things like cover crop here. Um, so this is the, exactly the opportunity um, for you as experts in this area to step in and say, you know, I get what you're trying to say here, but it's not working and maybe you should try this and really what a cover crop looks like is this or, or how it works, etc. Here's a couple different op opportunities for crop diversity. Some of these categories we've had, um, you know, five or six different icons that have been submitted by designers and we've sort of already narrowed it down in this case to sort of the two best. Um, or in, in other cases, the, the three best. So maybe, because uh, we have a few, just only a few minutes left, Nathan, Nathan maybe you yeah. want to talk about what the, what the opportunity is for a role in playing and giving, providing feedback and, and what that would look like from a practical standpoint. Right, so um, uh, for this particular challenge, uh, and it's not so different than the other ones, but I'll speak specifically to this. The opportunity is to, to come lend your uh, expertise and your experience uh, and make comments that we can then send back to the designers about how to modify these icons to make them um, uh, more clear and more accurate. Um, we pretty much work exclusively in Google Drive and, and, and Google Docs. So uh, you're seeing exactly the way we communicate to the designers. They have their own workbooks and we transfer work back and forth between the judges and the designer workbooks. But we work essentially by, um, you know, putting text right on the, uh, right on the slide and sometimes pointing and circling things. So it's fairly easy from a mechanical standpoint. Um, I would love to give you all and whoever's interested a URL to come in and you know see this workbook. I can give you a fresh copy if you want, if there's too many uh, other comments there. Um, but we would love for you to just go through sort of like what we're doing now and say, yeah, you know, a snail isn't the right kind of, uh, in invasive species or that doesn't look like a snail or whatever it is that um, occurs to you about what's not working or in some cases what's really working about any particular one of these icons. Um, you could come in at your leisure. Most of our judges spend about an hour a week um, when there's a, a critique cycle on um, just going through and making comments and then leaving within the, the judging period and that's it. So it's not a huge time sink. I guess it could be if you got really into it and you really <laughs> went through all the icons in a, uh, in a, in a really um, detailed way, but we're, we're, we would welcome any feedback at all that you would um, care to share with us so that we could make these as good as possible. And then we have other challenges. We have this third challenge on agrobiodiversity that's already started. Um, I'm happy to invite you into the judging of those as well. And then we'll have two more challenges after that. Uh, so really it's just go to our URL, 
and start typing on top of uh, these slides and sharing your thoughts. Um, and then, uh, you know, moving on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nathan and Douglas. Um, I see that there's a couple other questions that I don't think we'll be able to get to at wow. least by the top of the hour. And I know we need to close out to open a new Zoom call. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get with you, Nathan, as well on on uh, that URL and follow up with with this group, this calendar invite with the recording and, and relevant information that you hope to share. I think the last question Betsy has was the timeline, which is a good one. Well, so the we would love I mean, we, for, for Regen Ag, for the second challenge, we would love uh, feedback as soon as possible. So within the week would be really helpful uh, just because it's, uh, that it's in its sort of refinement review phase now. For the upcoming challenges like agrobiodiversity, uh, that challenge is gonna go for another two months. So there'll be a, a two or three more judging periods for that. Uh, stretched out over the next two months. So there's not an, there's not as much immediacy on that one as there is for Regen Ag. Um, but I would be happy to share the whole schedule with uh, any of you as well. That would be great. Yeah, and then we can send that out via email as well, Nathan. So. And, Bet and Betsy, I'll uh, send an email uh, follow-up as well. Say thanks for sharing your email address. Great, we'll follow up with this whole group and all those invited here. So thanks again, Nathan and Douglas and for everyone who joined, uh, we'll follow up with the recording and, and some links and timelines. So thanks again. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all.